the last session of uh, this uh, very uh, enjoyable workshop. And uh, my name is uh, Nadav. I'll be sharing this session. And uh, our first speaker is Christian Bauer from Berkeley. Please. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, I want to tell you about some work um, on quantum simulation for high energy physics, and in particular on effective field theories. And I understand that not, or not everybody, or maybe more precisely, most of you are not in the field of high energy physics. So I thought I'll spend the first uh, few minutes uh, explaining a little bit um, what we're trying uh, to answer. So high energy physics is sort of the, the, the um, science that really tries to understand um, interactions, forces of the, most, of the most fundamental particles. So here's a few things that I'm sure all of you know, right? We have atoms um, that consist of a nucleus and electrons. Um, well, going around it is not quite the right way to say it, but uh, electrons. An electron is, uh, is, is, um, uh, is, is sort of an elementary particle. At least we have not discovered any substructure to an electron. But uh, the nucleus is, is, uh, is something that has a structure. It consists of uh, protons and neutrons. And protons and neutrons, again, um, have internal structure. They are made out of quarks and, and gluons. Um, and uh, these quarks and gluons are thought to be uh, elementary or uh, as for, for everything we know about um, this, um, the science is that they are fundamental particles. So the standard model of particle physics, we had a talk just earlier today that uh, talked a little bit about this, is, um, is the theory that um, describes how these most fundamental particles interact with one another. Um, here's a nice graphic that shows this. So we have here um, these uh, quarks um, that I already mentioned, the up and the down quark are the two particles, the two quarks that are inside um, protons and neutrons. The other uh, quarks are heavier cousins of those two particles, which we don't see in everyday matter, but we can make at, in particle colliders. Then we have uh, um, a leptons. Um, the most uh, famous of the leptons is the electron that we have in every, um, in every atom. But there's heavier versions of that, a muon and a tau. And then we also have a charge neutral um, leptons called neutrinos. And those, um, on those fundamental particles, they interact by three forces. If we take leave aside gravity for the moment, uh, the first one is uh, the most well-known force that goes on, um, um, that, that is related to charge. That's uh, the electromagnetic force that's mediated by a force carrier called the photon. We all know that. But the strong force, which is responsible to bind uh, quarks into hadrons or into, yeah, into protons and neutrons, if you want, is the strong force. And the force carrier is a gluon. And then we have a weak force, which is uh, responsible nuclear beta decay and things like this. And it's mediated by uh, two particles called a W and the Z boson. And then there's one other particle that was only discovered quite recently. Well, recently, it was 11 years ago now at the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva, which is the Higgs particle. I'm sure you've um, heard about this. And, and that is a particle, I will not talk about it uh, for the rest of this talk anymore, but that gives mass to all these elementary particles. OK, so what high energy physics is about is trying to understand how do these particles interact one, with one another, what governs um, the forces, and so on. And um, I already said we have the standard model. It's been incredibly successful. It's now 50 years old, and every experimental test we have done to date on the standard model, um, the standard model has passed. So every test we've done, we've confirmed that the standard model is valid. Um, so why is high energy physics still around? Well, we know that the standard model is incomplete. Um, because if, you, if we actually look, we know quite a lot about what, um, what exists in the universe, what makes the matter and energy content of the universe. And what is quite humbling to high energy physicists that you know, all this great theory that I just told you about describes 5% of the universe. Ordinary matter makes up only 5% of the universe. There is um, about a quarter of the entire universe, the energy matter budget of the universe, is something that we call dark matter. It has sort of similar structure behavior as ordinary matter. Um, it has gravitational interactions, but we have not seen it. So we call it dark matter because it doesn't or interacts so weakly with light, if you want, that we haven't seen it so far. 
Um, so we, we, we can see it gravitationally. We see lots of things about dark matter that, that exist, that show us if we look out in the universe that we know dark matter exists. But we have no description. It's not part of the standard model. And then there's a whole other range called dark energy, which I will not talk uh, anymore uh, in this talk. So in order to test the standard model, I told you we do experiments. And um, we have to go to shorter and shorter distances, because remember in my first slide, I showed you the, um, the atom as a certain size, then the nuclear as a certain size, and it gets smaller and smaller. And in order to see these co small constituents, we have to probe things at very small distance scales, uh, which means very short wavelengths, which means we have to have very high energy. And in, to, to get these high energies, we build these ever bigger um, particle colliders. And here is uh, the current um, collider that is in operation in Switzerland. So this is the, the, the tunnel. This is the, cir this is the circular collider. We, um, we circulate protons around here. And then at four different points, we collide these protons together. And we see what comes out. And just for scale, this is the runway of the Geneva airport right here. Okay. So these, these things are big. Um, here is a tunnel, so it looks like a straight line, but it's not. It's actually a circular tunnel. Uh, it's, you sort of see the curvature at the end there, so it gives you another size. And inside these um, things, we accelerate the protons um, um, that then later on collide. Um, and so, so what, these, what these particles collisions do, they take two protons, they collide them, and they see what comes out. Okay, so it's something like this. Two protons collide. And something comes out that then we record in our particle uh, in our detectors. And so when, if we want to test the standard model, we want to see is whatever comes out of these particle collisions consistent with the standard model of particle physics, which, which means, means I have to take my standard model of particle physics, which somebody neatly um, put on a coffee mug, and then try to make the connection to these particle collisions and to see what comes out. And so we've gotten very good at this. And we use lots of classical computers to do these types of um, relations. However, there's very limited information we can get um, from these classical calculations. Essentially, a lot of it relies on perturbative calculations that we can do. We know very well how to do perturbation theory. And then we add some sort of non-perturbative modeling in there. But we really have no first principle understanding uh, of the non-perturbative dynamics that happens within the standard model. Um, whereas if we could use a quantum computer, there is actual, and I will try to motivate this a little bit more, that we can really do ab initio first principles calculations of the non-perturbative dynamics that happens. And that goes a little bit to the question that was asked, er, asked earlier, what kind of observables are we interested in? I'll talk a little bit more uh, about this throughout this talk. Um, if you're, if you're interested in a little more detail, in, in, um, we've, I've written together with uh, Zora Dabudi and uh, the, the community of people interested in quantum computing, high energy physics, a review article on the kind of physics that we're trying to do, um, or quantum computing that we try to do for high energy physics. So let's try to understand a little bit more of what it is that we're trying to do. So we're trying to do the following calculation. We start with two protons at the beginning at some early time, let's call it minus t, big T, t, think of a really large time in the past. And then I want a time evolve. And so these are two protons that sort of start moving towards each other. right? And all the interactions are described by the standard model, like how they move together and the collisions. So what I really want to do is I want to now take my Hamiltonian of my standard model, get the time evolution operator of this, and I want to evolve that system forward through the time when they collide with one another and stuff flies out. And then I want to see. And I want to take the overlap to find some particular final state x at some much later time t. And then really the probability, or this matrix element, is the probability that the LHC will see an event starting from two protons to some final state that I just showed you earlier. And then what I want to see is that probability consistent with how many times the LHC sees that particular event. Right? That's the kind of observable. That I'm, that I'm interested in. And you can see here that time evolution is a very crucial aspect of this. So three basic steps create some initial state um, um, at time t, evolve the state forward, perform a measurement. That's what I just said. So a big problem that we have in quantum field theories is, is that the Hilbert space is actually infinite dimensional. I have a field where a field theory is. I have a field at every point in space. 
and there's infinitely many points in space. And every field can have, can have a continuous value. So there's another infinite number of field values that I can have. So the Hilbert space is just infinite dimensional. So that, that could be a problem, right? Even, even the most powerful quantum computer will not have an infinite dimensional Hilbert space. Um, and so what, what do we do? Well, we, we need to do something to this. And what we do is we discretize the position. I'll talk about this more. And we digitize the field value such that in the end of the day, this continuous quantum field theory problem turns into finite dimensional Hilbert space such that this is actually quantum mechanics. OK, so, so how do we do this? So let me draw sort of um, think for, for, for the moment two dimensions. So what I just told you, I have at, at every point on this, on this uh, overhead, I could have a field living at, at, at any point here. And that field can have a continuous value of points. So what I can do, instead of sampling my fields at every point on this slide, let me just um, only look at discrete points on, on this point, at these, at these dots, and then give you the value of the field at those points. If I make these points close enough together, hopefully I can get a good approximation uh, to what we're seeing here. Um, <clears throat> so at every point here, I have a field value phi. So, so this is what is called a lattice field theory. And there's a few parameters of a lattice that you need to care about. There is what is the distance between two lattice points. Let me call that little l. And then there's the size, the total size of my lattice. Let me call that capital L. And capital L is, of course, equal times the number of lattice sites that I have in each dimension times the distance between them, little l. Then we have, at each point, we have a certain number of field values, digitized field values. We're not going to be like 64 bits um, as a classical computer. So we're going to deal with much smaller numbers. But you can work out what the Hilbert space is. It's essentially the number of field values per lattice site raised to the number of lattice sites, raised to the power of the number of lattice sites. And the power of the number of lattice sites is nL, the number of lattice sites per dimension, raised to the number power um, of uh, the, um, to the number of dimensions. OK, so here, here you go. That's, that's my problem. And once I have this, problem seems really easy. Right? Create an initial state vector at this time. Um, evolve it forward by matrix multiplication, if you want. And, and then dot it into the conjugate vector. And there you go. That's my answer. So how hard can it possibly be? Um, I'll, I'll tell you in a second that classically, <laughs> this is extremely hard. And so there was actually one beautiful paper written now more than um, more than 10 years ago by uh, Jordan Lee and John Preskill at Caltech, where they, where they um, um, investigated whether we could simulate this kind of problem on a quantum computer. Um, um, this is a really, I, I think it's a fantastic, fantastic paper. And, um, and what they've essentially concluded that you can do this calculation um, uh, in, with, with resources that are polynomial in the number of particles their desired precision, all, everything else. And, and, they, and they said that this achieves exponential speed up over the fastest classical algorithm. So essentially, what their statement is that uh, the problem is not exponential in the number of lattice sites, but it's polynomial in the number of lattice sites. So this is great, right? Exponential speed up, which means the problem lives somewhere here. Okay, it's not something I cannot do classically, but it's actually proven, at least for the scalar field theory case, it's proven to be in the complexity class that quantum computers can handle. All right, so now here's the elephant in the room. How many lattice sites do I need? Yes? Is there a proof you can do classically, or you just... No, it's like, like most things, um, nobody has found a way to do it. So but then, yes, so... Well, I mean, it could be that this, no, I mean, well, I would say it could be that this problem actually lies inside in here, right? That, that is a logical possibility, that I could actually find a classical algorithm to do that, but we don't know it. Yes, I th yeah, so I think that, yeah, that's true. There was another paper by, by Preskill where he actually showed that. Good. So how big is that Hilbert space? And so remember, what, what is important here is the first thing I have to tell you is, well, we need to know how many. I can't really play with the number of dimensions, right? We're living in three dimensions. Not much I can do about that. But I can play with how many field values do I need at each lattice site and how many lattice sites do I need. So let's start with the first number, the number of lattice sites. And now comes the question, what are you trying to answer? So let's try to see, like, how many lattice sites do I need? And you, if you think about this problem, um, 
um, a little bit, you'll, you'll realize very quickly that the shortest wavelength that you can describe, if you have a lattice with lattice spacing little l, is one where sort of a wavelength just fits within the lattice spacing. If I have like 10, if, if I have much shorter wavelengths, I can't see if I have 5 or 10 or 100 wavelengths sitting inside there. So since the energy is inverse proportional to, um, to the wavelength, that really tells me that the energy that I can have has to be less than 1 over L. So the largest energy I can describe in a given lattice is given by 1 over the lattice spacing. Now the same thing is true if I have a certain lattice size, the longest wavelength I can probe is something that sort of oscillates on that Oh, now my thing is just giving out. No, and that oscillates roughly on the size of my lattice. So my, my lowest energy I can get is roughly the size of the lattice. Okay? So and if you stare at this, you realize very quickly that the number of lattice sites is the ratio of the largest energy to the smallest energy you're trying to describe. So let's say we want to do, I showed you this beautiful picture of the Large Hadron Collider. So let's be bold. Let's simulate the whole simulation of the Large Hadron Collider. What do we need? Well, so the Large Hadron Collider acts or operates as energies, 7 TeV. Don't worry about what these numbers are. I'll tell you in a second. And, and sort of the strong interaction happens at scales of order 100 MeV. This is really where the non-perturbative regime happens. So we need to get something like this, which is about 70. The ratio of these two numbers is 70,000. That means I need 70,000 lattice sites per dimension. Cube that. That's 10 to the 14 lattice sites. Now it doesn't really matter anymore how many field values I need. Let's say I need like five bit digitization. So the dimension of the Hilbert space is 32 raised to the power of 10 to the 14. That's pretty big. You know, luckily Prescott told us we can do this in resources that are logarithmic in that. But I still need 10 to the 14 qubits. That's a lot of qubits. Logical, right? So, so, so this could be an issue to do this, you know, within our lifetime. Um, so I think it's going to be impossible to do this. But now we should actually ask the question, well, do we really need to go and simulate the whole Large Hadron Collider? Um, and so I don't have this, this plot here, but essentially what I just told you is that we have um, this, this, um, the fact that there's non-perturbative dynamics. But really what we can solve is things that we, that we cannot do perturbatively. And it's actually well known. It's uh, the Nobel Prize was awarded for asymptotic freedom in QCD, which tells you that the coupling constant get stronger as, as, the, as the length scales get bigger. And so that really means it's really the physics that I can't simulate is these long distance dynamics just around this 100 MeV range. Um, and so what I just told you is I'm trying to simulate all the way up to 7 TeV. That seems totally silly because I can do this perturbation theory here, right? So I should only use my quantum computer for those things that a classical computer cannot do. Um, but that means I have to find a way to actually separate sort of this long distance physics from the short distance physics and how, figure out how, it can, how can I do a calculation on long distance physics that then tells me something about the whole problem. And this is really what effective field theories, and that is that part of my title, effective field theories. So what effective field theories do, they separate long and short distance scales. Here's one effective theory I believe everybody in this room knows about, so let me just go over it. Um, so imagine I have a charge distribution, okay, some in here, and if you count it, there's actually one more red dots than blue dots. Um, so let's say it's a positive total, net positive charge. And let's call the size of this charge distribution capital L. And let's say I probe the electric field of this charge distribution distance R away from, from, that, from that charge distribution. Well, I can simulate the electric field lines. It looks pretty awful. And if I try to make a prediction here, um, you know, I, I, need, I need to get really good at simulating this. But imagine I'm trying to probe this at long distances, far away from the charge distribution. Well, we all know what happens, right? At some point, it just looks like radially symmetric field lines going out. The only thing I really care about is that the total charge was one down here. Not two, not minus one, but one. Um, we also know that I can actually do more. If I want to have corrections to this, well, I can include that there's maybe dipole in my charge distribution. I can do more. I can put a quadrupole in. Okay, so we have a systematic expansion to in, in the case where the distance scale um, R is much greater than L. And that's really what effective field theories are. You can systematize that and actually write down operators for this and so on. But that's really the basic idea of effective field theories. Um, so if I want to know something far away, I don't need to solve the whole numerical problem. I can solve a much simpler problem. I can solve an effective field theory. 
And this is also what happens in these particle collisions. If you actually look at what particle collisions or what comes out of particle collisions, you typically find, you find sprays of particles, sorry, sprays of particles that go sort of, that have lots of energy. All particles have lots of energy, but they go roughly in the same direction to each other at small angles. They're called collinear particles. And then you have some, some particles that can go anywhere, but their energy is much smaller. So you can do this very systematically um, by, by constructing a, a, a theory called soft collinear effective theory, which is something I did uh, now more than 20 years ago. And, and you can really write a, a theory down, an effective field theory that describes the full theory in the long distance regime where, where, where the non-perturbative dynamics matter. And to make a really long story short, what you can show that any cross section, any one of these probabilities of going from PP to X in that limit, you can write as some number that you can calculate perturbatively. That is all the short distance physics in it. And then other ingredients in here that encapsulate the long distance physics. And I'm just writing here letters down, but there's real field theoretical operator definitions for all of these objects here. So let's focus on the soft function S, which describes these soft particles. And you can actually work out in this theory what is the typical short distance scale that you need for this problem. And it turns out that if you have jets that have mass of order 100 GeV and energy of order 1,000 GeV, which is pretty typical at what you see at the Large Hadron Collider, the typical short distance scale of this soft function S is 10 GeV. Not 7 TeV, but 10 GeV. And that means if I want to simulate the soft function S on a quantum computer, which is non-perturbative, I only need to consider energy ranges from 100 MeV to 10 GeV. That's two orders of magnitude. Okay, and really what we're saying here is I don't need these very short distance fluctuations. I need only much longer distance fluctuations so I can make my lattice spacing much larger. I can make my lattice coarser. And uh, if you work it out, you now say 100 lattice sites per dimension. Unfortunately, we still live in three dimensions, so it's a million lattice sites. All right, we're a lot closer. I think five, five million qubits is a lot better than five times 10 to the 14 qubits. I do understand it's still not at the NISC era. I'll come back to some ideas of NISC later. But you know, I, what I wanted to get across, we really, by thinking about effective field theories, we can really lower, I mean, lowering anything by eight orders of magnitude is a pretty good start, right? When you just count yeah. the number of qubits, uh, Say again? When you just count the number of qubits, what about the volumes of these uh, circuits, et cetera? Correct. Uh, it has been shown that it's also logarithmic, so it, it's polynomial in that number. <laughs> then then, then the, the things that you need, yes. And now we can ask, you know, which power of the polynomial. Yes, so this is not NISC era, okay? I'm, I'm fully aware of that. But we've, you know, I, I want to get the point across that by thinking on, on, along those lines, we've really gained a lot. So, you know, just as a proof of concept, so we went, we went away and actually tried to compute. You know, can we do something like this? So we took, so here's now my soft function. Here's what the soft function actually looks like. Um, it's, I have to prepare the vacuum state of my, of my field theory. I need to act with a particular operator on it, which I can write down in terms of fields. I can, write, I can give you the exact expression of this operator. It doesn't really matter for, what, for, for the purpose of this talk. And then I want to measure the overlap with some final state x here. So we worked this out in a simpler case for a scalar field theory, this, which is not what the standard model is about. But we actually show that you can work out um, a, a quantum circuit that actually implements uh, this soft function directly. Now, remember, million qubits? We, we did want to run something. We didn't have a million qubits. So what we said, OK, let's look at one dimension, three lattice sites, two bit digitization. So we had six qubits. But you know, not so bad. So here's, and in and, and this question, the scalar field theory, we could actually do the calculation analytically. So here is uh, what you find. So this is so what I'm showing you here. This is the coupling constant G. And this is, which sits in this operator here. It tells you essentially how likely is, do you have an emission from the vacuum that can happen? And what I'm showing you here is the, tr the transition of the vacuum tr to um, transition to some other final state X. And this is the, the essentially the survival probability of, of the vacuum, that the vacuum will go back into the vacuum as a function of g. So first you see it's not, it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's not perturbative in the sense it's not quadratic or linear in g. It's actually an exponential function. Um, and, so, and then we can say, well, in, this, in the simplification that I did, three lattice sites, two-bit digitization, 
Um, how, what is the effect of, of all those simplifications? Sorry, this, this is three lattice sites that I did here, the analytical calculation. So what is two-bit digitization? What does that do? Um, uh, sorry, that's my yellow curve. So two-bit digitization introduces sort of that difference between yellow and blue. But then we want to see, let's put this on a quantum computer and see what actually happens. And so this is what we got when we put this on an IBM Q. This was, I think, three years ago. I suspect it would look a lot better on, on current devices. You know, and I looked at this. I'm always an optimistic person. I thought this looked great. I had the right shape and so on. Never mind that the fact that G equals zero, there's actually a true answer that nothing should happen. And, you know, we got only 80%. I should say when we ran this, we didn't put G equals to zero because then Qiskit just simplified the whole algorithm to the identity. We actually put like G equals 10 to the minus four or something. Um, okay, so what happens? And so, you know, what you see here is, uh, is, so is, is noise. Okay, so when we applied noise mitigation techniques that we had at the time, zero noise mitigation and so on, we got the black dots. And that, I think, most people probably agree is pretty, pretty nice. It looks pretty close to the yellow curve. Um, so I think what this tells me that quantum computers, you know, really have the ability to actually do calculations like this even if this is a very simple system. Um, since then, I mean, as I said, this was, I think, three years ago or something like this. We've done a lot more work. I can't, you know, mostly on the, I mean, the goal is to do this calculation for a, for a non-abelian gauge theory, like SE3. Um, so we've worked a lot about formulations, about on, um, of, of gauge theories, which you heard a little bit about earlier in the talk. Uh, earlier uh, this morning, and uh, worked also on some noise mitigation techniques to sort of tease more information about out of these NIST devices. And I just want to show you something that we're about to put out where we have a similar calculation as, we, as, as I just showed you for scalar field theory now for, for essentially QED, for U1 gauge theory. So it's the same kind of, kind of plot that I'm showing you here, transition probability as a function of a coupling constant, and this blue is the equivalent of uh, what I showed you earlier, that simulation. It's not actually run on an actual quantum device at the moment. Um, and this is for, for non-compact U1 gauge theory. I can also do something similar for a compact U1 gauge theory where actually analytical results are essentially not possible anymore. Good. So what I wanted to um, end with is a little bit about going more into the NISC uh, direction. So, so what I showed you is this, this eight orders of magnitude going from 10 to the 14 to 10 to the 6. But um, as I could see in your faces, you're not, still not buying that that is NISC. Um, so you can ask, like, what can we actually do in high energy physics um, if we have sort of smaller devices? Um, so one thing I could do is, you know, I just use the Large Hadron Collider as, as, as my thing. In particular, I said here the typical jets that they have with certain masses. If I actually look at narrower jets, I can say only look at events that have narrower jets, then actually the scale of my soft function comes down. So let's say I were to put myself only into a regime where I only need to go up to 1 GeV. So all of a sudden, I only need 10 lattice sites per dimension. And it's actually true for these U1 gauge theories. There's really interesting question uh, in, in two plus one dimensions, so two, two spatial dimensions, which is not nature, um, admittedly. But there's very interesting question, questions about um, formations or you know, non-perturbative dynamics, phase transitions, or something that you can answer. So I think one way to go is to say work in a regime where you sort of have order 10-ish order lattice sites per dimension, but then work in two dimensions. Right now we're talking 100. 100 lattice sites. Now we're starting to get into the realm where this might be possible in NISC. And then, of course, this goes to your question. You know, I haven't told you exactly how many gates we need. We're also limited by the number of gates we can do. And so this is something that we're actively studying at the moment of, you know, can you get interesting physics out, out of these NIST devices? Um, I wanted to end on uh, one thing that came out of a conversation I had earlier with uh, Siguru um, uh, earlier this morning. Um, um, that is something that sort of is always in the back of my head. And since a lot of NISC is about noise mitigation and so on, I just wanted to put this up. We, had, we heard earlier in the, uh, um, in the, in the talk, just before, before lunch, um, this idea of these gauge invariant subspaces. And I'm trying to essentially get rid of that gauge redundancy um, to, to make my Hilbert space smaller. And I think there's one interesting question whether I can use that information to my advantage, that there's gauge 
you know, gauge equivalent subspaces. So let me just set the stage for a second. So let's say I have a Hilbert space, psi, and let's say there is multiple gauge sectors um, that I can have, and for each one I have sort of a, so I have a tensor product of essentially a, a for each gauge sector, I have a different wave function. Now what is interesting and what we also heard earlier, that the Hamiltonian does not go, go between different gauge sectors. They always stay within each gauge sector which means my Hamiltonian is blocked diagonal, like this. So, right? so this, is, this is the matrix that only acts on, on this part of my Hilbert space, on the G1. This is the Hamiltonian that acts on this part of the Hilbert space, and so on. Okay? So if I were to prepare myself in my state, my initial state in, in this thing, I would always stay in this state. And a lot of the work is people trying to figure out how to actually get rid of all these Gs in my formulation to have my whole Hilbert space only written in terms of these size. But of course we know once I have a NIST device, noise surely is not gauge invariant in this sense, so most likely noise will look something like this. So we'll introduce all sorts of gate, you know, not off diagonal terms into my Hamiltonian. And so what noise will do, even if I implement my Hamiltonian perfectly, noise will probably mediate between these different gauge sectors. Um, and an interesting question, I think, is can we use that to actually mitigate the noise? Can we use that as a detection that noise actually happened and maybe correct for it? I don't have an answer. I'm not going to give you an answer here. This is more food for thought. I think it would be great if somebody could come up with an answer. There's, to my knowledge, one group has, uh, has used this idea. So what they've done here, this is a group uh, by Martin Savage, um, together with Natalie Klo and Jesse Stryker, now also um, about three years ago where they looked at an SU2 gauge theory in very small, um, very small systems. But essentially, they've shown here that there's four, um, um, four, four gauge sectors that I can have in this very simple scenario that they have. And what they did here is for, for a given um, simulation um, for, for, for different Hamiltonian, they actually tried to see what is the probability of staying in my physical subspace. Okay, And what they did here is they had um, they varied here the number of trotter steps. And then this R is um, where they did Z, uh, Z naught, um, Z and E, um, zero noise extrapolation. So R equals 1 means every C naught happens once. R equals 2 means every C naught is actually inserted three times. OK, and so what you can see is that when they went from, um, from a nominal circuit with one trotter step and then replacing every C naught by three C naughts, then their the survival probability dropped down. Okay, and if they extrapolated this result up, so this, this is now Z, Z and E, they, they got this result up here. But when they went to um, two trotter steps, they essentially showed that my survival probability was 25%, and I just told you I have four independent gauge sectors, so essentially it was totally random. So, so they used this, so when they actually presented results, they post-selected the only kept runs where it stayed in the same physical subspace, which clearly reduce the noise in their system. But I think there's a really interesting question whether you can do much more than that and actually use this as a, as a noise detection scheme and then even more a noise correction scheme. OK, uh, I said I don't, have, I don't have an answer to this. This was really food for thought. Um, so I don't, to my knowledge, there's no solid proposal um, to use this. So maybe people, and the reason I'm putting this up, it has nothing to do with high energy physics, right? It just has to do with a Hamiltonian that looks like this. If you have a Hamiltonian, so my question is you have a Hamiltonian that is blocked diagonal, okay, can you use that information to get information about the noise in the system? Any Say again? Any Hamiltonian is blocked diagonal? What do you mean by that? Sorry? I mean, I can diagonalize it into a block. Yes, oh, yes, yes, okay. Um, <laughs> Good, so let me come, this is it. So in summary, so the, the main messages I wanted to get across is effective field theories have this, have really this property, if you look at the right distance scale and you try to limit yourself to the right degrees of freedom that you care about, you can make your problem much, much simpler than what you otherwise would. I showed you that we can actually construct a circuit, even though I didn't show you the circuit, that actually implements such a problem. We can run it on on existing devices and get results that look encouraging. And then I sort of uh, speculate a little bit at the end on, on um, using gauge invariance for noise mitigation. And uh, that's it. This is sort of the group at Berkeley um, with whom 
I've worked with over, over the years. And I'll leave it here. Thanks.